Moving on to the biochemistry of the cell, we should investigate how the pioneers in biochemistry were able to isolate the different components of the cell, in order to study its structure, the enzymes and the processes therein. Also known as cell fractionation, the process is used to separate cellular components while preserving the individual functions of each component. This is a method that was originally used to demonstrate the cellular location of various biochemical processes. Other uses of subcellular fractionation are to provide an enriched source of a protein for further purification, and facilitate the diagnosis of various disease states. Biochemical research often requires the isolation of a particular subcellular organelle either first, to study the organelle intact, or secondly and more commonly, to isolate and study a specific substance from that organelle. And, in order to study the function of an organelle in depth, it is first necessary to isolate it in relatively pure form. To continue, subcellular fractionation involves, essentially the homogenization or destruction of cell boundaries by different mechanical or chemical procedures. This is then followed by the separation of the subcellular fractions according to different parameters. This may be according to the component's different mass, surface, or specific gravity. Subcellular fractionation generally entails three phases, extraction, homogenization, and centrifugation. The first phase involves extraction, also known as cell disruption. The objective of this phase is the maximum disruption of the whole cell, but minimum damage to subcellular compartments, particularly the organelles to be studied. This is achieved via various mechanical or chemical procedures. In order to achieve the minimum damage to the subcellular components, this is usually done in optimal and physiologic conditions, to prevent the loss of biologic activities of the cell. This is carried out by the employment of aqueous and physiologic solutions and avoidance of extremes of pH, osmotic pressure, and especially of high temperature. The second phase is that of homogenization. Once the cells have been disrupted, their constituents will be liberated into a buffer solution that is isotonic to stop osmotic damage. The resulting suspension is a cell-free system containing many intact organelles. This is known as the homogeny. The samples are then kept cold to prevent enzymatic damage. The third and last phase is centrifugation. This is the process of separation of the soluble cell fluid from the particulate matter, as well as the further fractionation of the latter in the homogeny. The different components are separated according to differences in their properties like mass, size, etc. This phase usually based on the principle of rate zonal centrifugation, which states that components in the homogeny have different mass to volume ratios and sizes and thus, will sediment under centrifugal forces at different rates. Therefore, heavier and larger bodies will sediment under low speeds and low gravitational forces. And consequently, lighter and smaller substances will require higher speeds and higher gravitational forces. Generally, the cellular homogenate is first filtered or centrifuged at relatively low speeds to remove unbroken cells. Then centrifugation of the homogenate at a slightly faster speed, or for a longer duration will selectively pellet the nucleus. We all know that the nucleus, measuring from 5 to 10 micrometers in diameter, is the largest organelle, and thus the first to precipitate out. A centrifugal force of 600 g, or 600 times the force of gravity for 10 minutes, is necessary to sediment the nuclei. This first fraction is known as the nuclear fraction. The undeposited material, or the supernatant, is next centrifuged at a higher speed, at 15,000 g for 5 minutes, which deposits the mitochondria, chloroplasts, lysosomes, and peroxisomes. This fraction is known as the mitochondrial fraction. Subsequent centrifugation in the ultracentrifuge at 100,000 g for 60 minutes results in deposition of the plasma membrane, fragments of the endoplasmic reticulum, and large polyribosomes. Subsequently, the recovery of ribosomal subunits, small polyribosomes, and particles such as complexes of enzymes requires additional centrifugation at still higher speeds. These fractions, containing the plasma membrane, endoplasmic reticulum, and polyribosomes, are collectively known as the microsomal fraction. And lastly, only the cytosol, the soluble aqueous portion of the cytoplasm, remains undeposited after centrifugation at 300,000 g for 2 hours. This is a simplified list of the different centrifugal fractions and their respective components. Again, the different centrifugal fractions, in the order of decreasing mass or density, are nuclear, mitochondrial, microsomal, and lastly soluble. Please do remember the different organelles or components belonging to each fraction. There are various ways in determining the purity of the organelles isolated from subcellular fractionation. 
This may involve processes that are not only tedious, but expensive and inconvenient as well, like electron microscopy. Additionally, several immunological techniques can be used with specific antibodies specific to the different organelle membrane proteins. However, what proved to be the most convenient and least expensive process to assess organelle purity is the use of certain marker molecules. Marker molecules are certain substances, be it may biomolecules or enzymes, that are specific for an organelle. A very good example is testing for DNA in order to determine if the organelle extracted and isolated were indeed the nucleus. The next slide will give us a list of the different maker molecules for certain organelles. Here is a tabulated summary of the different organelles, and the respective important markers, that are contained therein to assess the purity of the isolated organelles, from the process of subcellular fractionation. Feel free to pause the presentation to read through each and every item. This concludes the Biochem Seriet episode of the lecture on Introduction to Biochemistry and the Biochemistry of the Cell. Feel free to watch the other Biochem Seriet episodes of this lecture as linked below in the description.